What's going on, everybody? It is that time again. We are back. The Sooners Illustrated Podcast, episode 96 on this Friday, July 12th, 2024. 49 days, seven weeks from today, from the opener, Oklahoma and Temple in Norman. Josh Calloway, Colin Kennedy, I'm back from vacation. We had a bit of a show gap here. It's been like, I think, 10 days. It's our last podcast, which may be the biggest gap we've had since we've been doing the show um, starting last summer. So we're back on track. SEC Media Day is our next week. Colin and I are certainly going to preview that a little bit here on the program. We're all going to be there, Colin and myself, along with Tom Green and James E. Jackson. We're all going to get down to Dallas for a full week of SEC Media Days. It's going to be interesting as we get ready to kick off this season here in uh, you know about a month and a half. Obviously, a lot of recruiting stuff we want to catch up on as well with our guy CK. We haven't had a show between Colin and I in, I think, over two weeks. We've got a lot of stuff to catch up on. Loaded show for you on a Friday. Send you into the weekend, and then we'll have the SEC Media Days coverage next week. We'll talk about it a little bit more in just a bit. But CK, let's let's catch up on some stuff. This will be a catch up for me just as much as anybody tuning in uh, as I've been gone last you know a week or so. Let's go backtrack to to Amari and Robinson. So he's the pickup um, since the last show. He committed four star composite safety from Little Rock, Arkansas. This is a guy you talked about before on the show. You you think a lot of them. Uh, obviously, he's a guy that Oklahoma zeroed in on, became a priority. They locked it down. Brandon Hall, another big get. He's been one of those guys, kind of like Emmett Jones a little bit on the offensive side. They just it's like one right after the another of just big get after big get after big get. Talk about Amari and Robinson. What went into the pickup, the player, all that kind of paint the picture for OU fans about this guy that they bring in here. This is who Oklahoma wanted at safety. And I think the important context to add is that from an outsider perspective, I think a lot of folks kind of tracking Oklahoma recruiting thought, okay, if OU were to miss on a prospect like a Jonah Williams, Mm -hmm. then maybe Amari and Robinson is the pivot point. But what I'm here to tell you, and, and I think a lot of Oklahoma fans already know this, Oklahoma wanted both Jonah Williams and O'Marion Robbins for months. The Sooners were in this thing for an extended amount of time. I know, especially back in the early portions of the spring, when he took a couple of visits, OU kind of furthered its standing to a point where some believed that OU was the leader around March. But then some things cool off. I believe you have a dead period kick in. and Arkansas, LSU, Oregon are all in the picture here. And so naturally things kind of settle, make things a little bit more interesting. But Marion Robinson, I'll say it again, his decision the Friday of the Champion Barbecue to delay his commitment. Mm. He was going to announce on June 29th, if I remember correctly, he pushes that back to July the 6th. And that, that announcement being on the Friday of the beginning of his official visit in Norman, I personally think was intentional. Why? Because he's buying himself more time to evaluate a program sure. that at one point or another was potentially his leader. So he takes that trip, now understanding he has more time to evaluate Oklahoma as a potential landing spot. And I think out of that weekend, man, it was all OU. And you got to tip your cap not only to Brandon Hall, but Todd Bates, J.P. Lossman, Xavier Brewer, so many members of this Oklahoma coaching staff who helped get this one done. I I believe it was was on a Marion Robinson's Instagram Live that Todd Bates took the phone and said, OU fans, run it up for this guy, best safety Mm -hmm. in the country. And now Oklahoma, in their mind, gets the best safety in the nation and their number one target on the board. And the last thing I'll say, Josh, how about this DB Hall in 2025? Yeah. Marion Robinson likely rounding it out. Obviously, Jonah Williams expected to land elsewhere, somewhere between Oregon or Texas A&M. Man, you get a guy like Tristan Haynes, Luke Hawkins, so on and so forth. Marion Robinson joining Marcus Wimberley in the safety hall. It's a pretty quality group. And again, the guy that they had atop their safety board now into the fall. Yeah, you know, we've talked about it a few times, but, you know, Brandon Hall continues to just stack up these guys. I mean, you look at last cycle, you know, with your Jaden Hardy and uh, Reggie Powers and obviously Peyton Bowen going back to that. You know, you bring in, you know, you have Robert Spears Jennings and obviously Billy Bowman has developed into this elite 
you know, one of the best safeties in the country type of player. Like he's, he's not the flashiest coach for whatever reason, doesn't get a lot of headlines, but it seems like he just, that room is one of the strengths of the roster and has been since he's been here. They continue to stockpile talent and certainly no different here with Omar and Robinson who, you know, we have a just a three star. He's a composite four. He's a really, you know, the sense I've gotten and you know better than me, but the sense I've gotten, he's a really strong three star. He could maybe elevate up at some point. You could speak to that better than me, but, you know, this is a yeah. another really good pickup, uh, obviously. And like you said, the secondary in general, when you loop in all the quarterbacks in this 25 cycle that we talked about a bunch of times, headlined by, of course, Tristan Haynes and the number of other ones. I mean, that is this is as good of a secondary haul, it feels like, in a while for Oklahoma because there, there's a lot of guys here who are difference makers uh, at the next level. Amari Robinson certainly in that group. Amari Robinson is an 88-grade three-star in the 24-7 sports rankings, and people have to understand – a three-star football player is a very darn good football player. But on right. top of that, if you're an 88 or 89 grade three-star, which is the highest grade of that ranking, that is what is considered a verified power four caliber starter with future for a potential impact player type mm -hmm. at the P4 level. So essentially 24-7 sports is saying this is a guy who could potentially go on to start at safety for OU. And when you cut on the tape, Josh, it checks out. What I love about Amarian Robinson, look, Six foot ish, probably 180 pounds. So not the biggest, the 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 longest, like arm length or the weight. Like it, it's probably not going to jump out of you from a frame perspective. Why I love Amarian Robinson, why I think he's deserving of not only this current high three star grade, but potentially, I'm telling you, he's got a chance with a strong senior season to potentially climb into that four star territory. Three phase playmaker. Plays on the offensive side of the ball. I believe you can see him playing wide receiver, running back, even some wildcat quarterback. Defensively, yeah. safety. I think he gets some snaps in at corner and nickel as well. But then you see him on special teams. And I personally have an affinity for players who have that third phase to their game. And I think that's going to help a Marion Robinson not only find his way onto the field early in kickoff coverage or whatever else, Maybe he gets some returns. Maybe that also helps him later down the line from a developmental perspective, right? I, mm -hmm. Special teams bring so much to the table, and it adds to a Marion Robinson's game, a game that I highly respect. And, again, I don't think he's the most toolsy from a frame or a, a height, weight, speed perspective. Sure. But at the same time, a Marion Robinson, he has some very sh shifty athletic traits to his game. And it shows in all three phases of it, which you have to love if you're Oklahoma. And listen, again, he is part of a DB class. Malik Hawkins, a high three-star mm -hmm. grade player, verified that grade at OU camp. One of the most physical and aggressive timing-based corners I have seen on the camp circuit so far. Tristan Haynes, that's a height, weight, speed corner if I've ever seen it, right? Marcus Wimberly is a high three-star grade because he tests – out the roof I, I, in the athletic combine right. perspective. Like all of these guys check certain boxes. And then Marion Robinson, the frame, sure. But like when you're looking at an on-field perspective, he checks a lot of boxes, and that's why Oklahoma wants him. 100%. Let's shift over to the offense, specifically the offensive line. So this is uh, certainly something we've talked about a lot. Backing up, you know, before the break we talked about it, they brought in Darius Afalava. They got him committed. Mm -hmm. Um, a few days ago, Lamont Rogers, who we talked about a bunch of times, ends up at Missouri. Still certainly some other huge names floating out there. So, Colin, I guess we'll kind of, you know, round it up here a little bit on the offensive line. Kind of where we're at a little bit. Obviously, like we said, you brought in off lava to go with Hollenbeck and Ryan Foji, who we talk about as an elite prospect as well. Um, you didn't get Lamont Rogers. Like I said, there's other big names hanging out that we talked about a bunch of times. Little temperature check for you uh, on this offensive line recruiting right now for Bill Beedmo as they uh, you know try to continue to add to it. And like I said, there's huge names hanging out there. You, you hate to miss out on Lamont Roger. Talk about what the player he is, but there's other big names you can still pivot to. Certainly, where are you kind of at on all of this right now on the offensive line, you know, side of things as uh, fans try to figure out how things are going right now. Yeah, I'll try to go quick here because I'm going to try and touch on all four. So we'll start with Lamont Roger. The commitment to Missouri, I'm here to tell you, I think a lot of folks 
just want to say highest bidder, highest bidder, highest bidder. I, I tried to explain this at the time. It's not like I don't know what the numbers are, folks. You know what I mean? Like I'm right. doing my due diligence here. And Lamont Rogers' decision to commit to Missouri had a ton to do with the recruiting effectiveness and the relationship that he had with the one Brandon Jones, who is the Missouri offensive line coach. One of the strongest relationships that he built alongside Bill Biedenboe. Missouri won out because Lamont Rogers just built a personal affinity for that Mizzou coaching staff and kind of the home feel that he found in Columbia. And so the Tigers get a huge win. But at the same time, Josh, I, I just objectively, I think everyone kind of knows that this one isn't over. And that's not mm-hmm. just an Oklahoma thing. I mentioned it to our subscribers a number of times. I've been told that not only Oklahoma is very much working on an effort to try and flip Lamont Rogers over the next few months. But I think there are other SEC programs that have been quietly lurking and preparing to have a plan in place to try and go get this guy. And I, I've shared that potential list with our subscribers. Some big brand names in the SEC have been watching Lamont closely. And they will probably join Oklahoma in a potential attempt to try and sway him away from Mizzou. Now, getting him away from Missouri is very difficult because, again, he made that decision on his own. But I I think as it relates to Lamont, that is one to continue to track going into the fall. Now, it's important to have that context because the next couple of things I want to talk about. As we sit here today at 1235 central time on friday july 12th you probably saw me if you're watching us on youtube check my phone i've got the notifications on because michael tasusi as a lot of recruiting diehards will know is scheduled to make an announcement today he has not dropped that announcement so we can't talk about it here on the pod just yet it i'm quite certain is not going to be a commitment but we're expecting it to be somewhere along the lines of a top schools list and potentially even an outlined Timeline for a decision. So Michael Vasusi right now, just look, the other day I got to catch up with him in person for a little bit. We just checked in and I mean, I live three minutes away from Louisville's high school stadium. Some, some of those guys were out there training and we just, we just got to do kind of like a, not on the record and a general check-in. Right. And, And that's kind of the cool part of these these recruitments, you build that relationship and you kind of get to know where, where things stand. And the thing that I kind of shared with our subscribers last night, you know, there is such a thing as a middle ground in recruiting. Mm-hmm. And so often there's all this, this itch to identify who leads in a process, especially when we're talking about not just a five-star, but like one of the freakiest five-star athletic profiles you will ever sure. find. And by the way, Josh, something I want to mention just to reiterate, because we talk about him so much. Michael Vasusi is like a legit 6'5", plus 305-plus pounds. I believe he told me he's getting around the 310 range, and you would not be able to know he carries it like it's 285, which is just insane. (laughs) Right. Last I checked, he's turning 17 years old today. And why that's important, he is younger than some 2026 recruits as a 2025 five-star, which – For those who don't know, when you are younger than your average grade, that projects very favorably to the future of your athletic career. And so the guy checks so many boxes, and because of that, he has a really hard decision in front of him. And kind of the read that I got talking to him the other day and then reading the tea leaves with some folks on the recruiting trail, we are about as neck and neck of a recruitment for Michael Vesusi as we've ever seen before. I think Oklahoma has really almost pulled even with Texas. That being said, anyone who wants to act like Oklahoma has overtaken Texas is just not accounting for the facts. Texas still feels really good about its standing. Mm -hmm. There are going to be a lot of variables at play here, but I think what Oklahoma did from a relational perspective over over the last few weeks has really helped the Sooners make this about as interesting as it's ever gotten. And so a couple quick things I will say to close on Michael Pasusi. Number one, the decision timeline, I still believe, is sometime in early August. 
So we're not done talking about this kid. But number two, the clarity that so many are seeking is going to be found in the next couple of weeks because the dead period will be lifted soon. I'm not ruling out, but I'm not saying either that visits are on the table because he could easily try and schedule a trip or two in there before making a decision. So it's something to monitor. But regardless, we're going to figure out where this is probably going sometime over the next two to three weeks. And until then, I would say with Michael Fasusi, it's getting really interesting as the Red River rivals battle it out for one of the most elite profiles right across the country. Now, let's transition here. Let's say Michael Pasusi goes to Texas, which is very much a possibility. That would then, number one, either lead Oklahoma to go even more chips to the center of the table on a potential attempt to try and flip Lamont Rogers, or as many people know, a couple weeks ago I put in the crystal ball pick for Alabama in relation to Ty Haywood, the five star offensive mm-hmm. tackle out of Den Ryan. I think it is very much on the table for Ty Haywood to choose Alabama sometime over the next couple of weeks. I don't see that one dragging on too much longer. And whether it's Keelan Russell, who we just named not only a five-star, but a top 10 player in the country, he's the quarterback commit for the Alabama Crimson Tide. Awesome player, awesome kid. He's heavily recruiting Ty Haywood to be his left tackle in the future. Alabama, some of the other Alabama commits are going after Ty pretty heavily. And obviously he grew up a big fan of the Crimson Tide being from Mississippi. I not only think Alabama's in prime position to potentially land Ty Haywood sometime soon, but I also am not ruling out the potential for Oklahoma in some world where maybe Michael Pasusi goes to Texas. Lamont Rogers is either still being a little bit tricky from a flip perspective or he stays firm with Mizzou. Maybe Oklahoma tries and circles back with Haywood in the fall. And so something to monitor. I think the Ty Haywood thing has gone a different direction, but I don't know that I need to close the book on that one just yet. Sure. But the last thing I'll say is Andrew Babalola, the other five-star offensive tackle. I think there are some folks who maybe gave way too much false optimism as it relates to Oklahoma standing. I think go use towards the top. I just think Michigan and Stanford have always kind of been the top two. And as we sit here today on this Friday, I still feel like it's a Michigan and Stanford battle at the top with programs like Oklahoma, Auburn, and a few others hovering on the outside there. So that's kind of an offensive tackle check-in, but getting Darius off a lot to join Ryan Foje, who is still stocked up, and then Owen Hollenbeck. OU's doing just fine on the offensive line recruiting front. And so now, again – that big game hunting territory that we talk about so often, we're, we're kind of, it feels like heading down the final stretch of trying to get one of these big fish. Sure. You know, my takeaway there, you know, and that was great stuff. Obviously a great temperature check on all those guys. My, my takeaway there, it would seem to be the sky is not falling yet. Right. Um, Cause there was certainly yeah. a lot of, especially with where Lamont went, you know, with, with the history there. Uh, of the last year and and change, I guess more than a year now, going back for a couple of other guys. But um, land at Missouri, there was a lot of just geez, you know, uh, uh, an exasperation of the fans, which is fair. But it's not over yet with Lamont, like you said. And they still feel like they got a great shot for Fasusi. We'll see what happens with the other two. But, you know, plus you have a good group already in, like you just said. So it's, it's kind of like don't freak out just yet. Um, mm. even if they just settle with these three guys, let's say they don't get anybody else, and it's Afalava, it's Hol- it's Hollenbeck, and it's Foji, that's still a pretty good group, uh, obviously, to, to go in with and to sign in 25. You want to get that big fit, that other huge fit we talked about. We've been talking about these guys for a long time. But, you know, there's still, you know, you still have some pieces here. It's not, you know, the burning house around the dog. This is fine just yet. Like, there's still some time to figure it out. So. Uh, that's where things are kind of at with offensive line. Great update there uh, from our guy, Colin. All right, I think we'll shift over a little SEC Media Days preview. It's next week in Dallas. Uh, like I said, we're all going to be there. We're looking forward to it. Brand new world. Um, be the first time for t- uh, Colin, James, and myself. Tom has been there before he uh, many times. He covered Auburn for a long time. 
And he actually went out there last year for us, um, which feels like a very long time ago. But he did do that for us last year. So we had a presence. But the whole group's going to be there this year. They moved it in Dallas. That was really nice of Greg Sankey to do that. That's very convenient for us. So the full group's going to be there. For Oklahoma, obviously, Brent Venables will be there representing, along with Jackson Arnold, Danny Stutzman, Billy Bowman. If you gave me one guess, three players, that was who I would guess. So very uh, likely suspects there for who's going to represent Oklahoma. It'd be interesting to see what they all have to say. First time we've heard from any of them since spring. I mean, so it, it's a, a nice little check-in with all those guys on how things are kind of going and looking forward to this season in the SEC, which, like I said earlier, is seven weeks from today. Colin, I thought it'd be fun. Let's kind of go back and forth, and we're going to just kind of draft slash just take – Team slash storylines slash headlines, however you want to take it, that we're looking forward to. I know you have one that you're really on, so I'm going to let you have the number one pick, and then we'll bounce it back to me. We'll kind of just go back and just take teams, like I said, team storylines, headlines that we're looking forward to next week uh, down there in Dallas. So I'll let you go. So I'll let you start. This one feels like a layup. It's whoever Eli Drinkwitz chooses to talk trash to, namely Oklahoma, right? <laughs> I mean, it's yes, it feels inevitable. Ties in like, what we're just talking about. I don't know when it's going to happen, but you know Eli Drinkowitz, who, I mean, his habits of talking trash, whether it's to Dan Mullen or Josh Heupel or whoever else, like, Drink is going to have something to say. And I think, Josh, what people are forgetting about this, too, is it's like, okay, everyone knows about the banner that's been going back and forth between Oklahoma and Missouri, the fan bases and whatnot. Not, what, a couple of weeks ago, a bunch of OU assistant coaches started tweeting out pictures of the OU Missouri rivalry with Curtis Lofton <laughs> headbutting a Missouri player. And it was like, yeah. oh, they're, I think it was DeMarco Murray, Bill Beanbow, and a few other like tried and true Oklahoma assistants that kind of hinted towards their maybe mutual disdain that, sure. that, that, that is there and that what should be a rebuilding rivalry. And so, Knowing that that happened, I don't know what Drink's going to say, but with the first pick, like, I got to go who and when Eli Drinkowitz is going to talk trash to, especially if it ends up being Oklahoma. I know that, you know, OU fans are very, you know, hesitant to call that a rivalry, and I think that's fair because Oklahoma has sure. dominated. I don't think I ever saw Oklahoma, Missouri as a rivalry necessarily before. They had some big games, played the Big 12 championship game, things like that. But there is no argument that, in November, that is going to be one of the most toxic games, maybe of all time. Like, that is going to be mayhem in Columbia. I cannot wait for that game. That's going to be just, I mean, like I said, I think toxic is the perfect word for it. It's going to be nasty in there. It's going to be great. I don't know. I, I, I think there's, there's. listen, and before we get to your pick, I, I do want to bring this up because I'm curious for your take quickly on this as well. You can talk about the the, the history dominance or whatever, but part of rivalries – are the feelings between the schools. Sure. And I've seen people talk about this Oklahoma-Missouri budding dispute as like the next bedlam for Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel about that, but like from a mutual disdain perspective, uh, like you mentioned, that atmosphere is going to be electric. And it was always electric in Stillwater. And so we can talk about serious history all we want. But, like, it, it's going yeah. to, if not be a rivalry from a record perspective, it's a rivalry just because I don't think that these not only programs, like, I don't even think these coaching staffs really like each other either. Sure. So No, it does. It has that Bedlam feel because it's, you know, obviously the proximity and everything. But also there's, for Oklahoma, they feel like Missouri is beneath them, right? And that's very similar <laughs> to the Bedlam feel, which is part of, like, the, the angst there. So it is very similar. We'll see what happens when they actually play and if it can continue to grow. I don't know what the schedule's going to look like. I mean, obviously, we know that Missouri returns the favor next year in 2025. They come to Norman after that. I mean, who knows what the way the schedule's going to be. But it, it's that's going to be a fun game. So I'm with you completely. You know that Drink's not going to be able to resist. He's going to say something. So that, that's yeah. a good one. I'll go. There's a lot of options. The SEC is loaded with personalities. I'm going to go. I, I think I'm really interested to see what, what Josh Heifel says. Um, in mm -hmm. regards to Oklahoma, obviously, in particular, coming back to Norman, this is such a fascinating storyline. That game is going to be so intriguing. It's the first SEC game, obviously, so there's there's all that in it of itself. But obviously, everybody knows the story with Josh Heupel. I mean, the guy won a national title here the last time they won one. 
and he was the offensive coordinator at Oklahoma, and it, it, it didn't end well. Um, Josh Heifel feels like he was wrong with the way that that ended, and he has a fair gripe because they brought in a guy to kind of do what he wanted to do in Lincoln Riley. Now, you can't really argue with how that worked out. Obviously, Lincoln Riley engineered great offenses. They had Heismans, all that. And it's worked out for Josh Heupel. He's the head coach at Tennessee, and he's winning. You know what I mean? So it kind of worked out in the end for everyone. But it's just such a weird dynamic in that he's a beloved former player. I'm sure he doesn't hate OU, obviously. But there's still that that weird feelings there. And that's going to be a game that you know he wants to win as bad as any as he's ever had, probably. So I'm curious. I'm sure it'll come up what he has to say about getting back to normal. I know he's talked about it before, but as it kind of gets nearer, just what the what those feelings are going to be like for him whenever that that day comes in a little over two months. Because that that game is when Tennessee comes to Norman, obviously, and I don't think it's under the radar necessarily, but with the Bama game and LSU and Texas, it's just kind of like that. That game is right up there for me as far as most excited for next season. That, that's going to be a scene. So I'll, I'll take Tennessee and, and Josh Heifel because that's going to be that's going to be a fun one. I'm really looking forward. Look, to that. I, I think it's a great pick by you because I, I lived in the state of Tennessee for about a year, year and a half, and that was when Heifel had them rolling. They upset Alabama. It was that magical season that they had and. All these Tennessee grads that I would be, you know, around on Broadway or whatever else. I mean, they they were all about Hypo and the Vols and where that that program was heading under his guidance. But also sometimes I'd just be talking SEC ball with some folks in Tennessee bars, and they would always kind of ask me about the Oklahoma days for Hypo, not just as a coach, but as a player. And I would have to tell them kind of about how just drastically different those two worlds ended up being. And I think for a lot of people, it's hard for them to register the way that things kind of went for a guy who meant so much to the program as a player, right? Sure. And so not only just how Eiffel handles it, and maybe like if Brent is asked about it, what he's going to have to say, because I think Brent's going sure. to, I think Brent's going to be very complimentary. About They're familiar That's with each my, other. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, maybe I'm naive, but I think Brent's, potentially going to try and stick up for Josh. I'm also just very curious to see what some folks have to say about that dynamic and what their take on it as well um, as we get that game, which I believe is kind of a, a sneaky game, too, to open up SEC play. Just in It'll, be awesome. It'll be awesome. So, Hopefully they're tight. So going off of that pick, Josh, I actually kind of make a, a selection in relation to your pick of Tennessee. You know, when SEC play begins, Tennessee is going to come to Norman, and their quarterback, former five-star Nico Iamaliava, is going to be part of the headlining quarterback battle, in my opinion, with Jackson Arm. And two former five-stars battling it out, and that's kind of where I want to go. Is like Tennessee is going to be the opening opponent for OU. That's going to be Jackson Arnold's SEC debut, and he's getting ready to not only debut as Oklahoma's full-time starting quarterback. I mean, he is basically getting ready to debut as the representative of the program as this Blue Bloods signal caller. At, at SEC Media Day specifically, he's, he's going to be the guy, and you know he's going to get grilled. You know he's going to be the center of attention for not just Oklahoma coverage, but for national landscape coverage. Everyone's going to want to try and – figure this guy out and just kind of knowing Jackson Arnold, I, I can't wait to see how Jackson Arnold does during SEC media days because there's not a ton of quarterbacks coming to SEC media days. I saw Connor Wigman's not going to be there. I believe it's like Quinn Ewers, Garrett Nussmeyer, Taylor Green, and a few others. Jackson Arnold's going to command a lot of attention that's typically drawn towards these quarterbacks, especially in this premier conference. And him being kind of having that initial first moment of being the program guy at OU, mm -hmm. being that former highly touted player, this is his first live exposure to what life is like as the OU quarterback. And I, I can't wait to see how he handles it. 100%. I'm with you there, too. I mean, Jackson has been so good um, at that since he got here. You really kind of forget how young he is a lot of the time when you talk to him, even going back to when he was in high school, when I got the chance to talk to him at Elite 11, things like that. He um, has always been very mature, and I think he's going to handle it great just to kind of piggyback there 
what does Danny Stutzman have to say? Not that I think he's going to get up there and just while on the mic, but he's Danny. You know, so you always have to be aware of that. And it's funny because that matchup with Nico, because those, those two guys are really kind of like the golden child children of the of the conference. And Nico is one of the reasons that Arnold's had to take a little bit of heat in the in the since last year, because, you know, not that Arnold had a bad bowl game. The turnovers were obviously a, a, a thing. And obviously it's been talked about to death since then. But he also had lots of great moments. He's through for three over 300 yards. But obviously at the same time, Nico lit up Iowa. Tennessee crushed Iowa. And so a lot of people have used that as a, well, look what he did. He, his first start, the exact situation, right? So that's a fun matchup. And, yeah, Arnold stepping into this is right up there. It's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be a lot of people's introduction to him. Like you said, for us, we kind of get have gotten to know him and things like that. But nationally, that's going to be his introduction. So good, good one there. Oh, boy, there's so many on the board. There's so many things. I think I'm going to go – I'm going to go with Kirby Smart and just kind of his overall lay of the land here with Oklahoma and Texas. Because, you know, with, with Nick Saban gone, Kirby Smart's the big dog now. I mean, he's the face of the league. It's kind of shocking, staggering, how many coaches in the SEC have not been around that long. Have you really, really looked around? It's kind of crazy. They're all pretty new, except for really Kirby Smart. And Mark Stoops, right? Those are the two guys who have been around for a while. Kirby Smart is kind of the face of the conference now in a lot of ways with Nick Saban no longer around. Just curious. I'm, I'm sure he'll get asked a lot of big picture kind of questions about the conference and the league and the way it's moving because he's kind of like the, like I said, he's, he's, he's the new Saban in terms of he's the de facto kind of leader, head honcho of the thing right now. What mm-hmm. he has to say about Oklahoma and Texas and the direction, how they're going to adapt to the conference and the, the general – Kind of all of it. I'm very intrigued in him. He's a very well-spoken guy, and I just – that's one that really intrigues me. He's on the same day um, as Oklahoma on Tuesday, and so I, I'm, I'm sure it's going to come up. I'm very just kind of interested in hearing what he has six. I can't recall, and again, not that I'm plugged into what George is doing on a day-in, day-out, but I don't think he's really spoken publicly about that that much. So I'm, I'm very interested in that because – like I said, he's kind of just the, the face of the conference now in a lot of ways. So I'm very interested in hearing what he had to say about kind of everything going on with the SEC in this this supercharged season with the 16 teams now. That's an awesome pick by you because it, it I think it familiarizes Oklahoma fans with the new landscape of what this program right. is about to enter into. Because exactly like you mentioned, Nick Saban was kind of seen as the de facto voice of college football and its changing landscape. But now that not only he is retired, but I mean, the NCAA has basically crumbled as some sort of authoritative figure. No one, no, no one's acknowledging the NCAA anymore. Yeah. Nick Saban's gone. So who is, who is going to speak to some of the major changes that are taking place? And, and, you know, Josh, like to, to your point, when Oklahoma hired basically a salary cap advisor from the Philadelphia Eagles to consult with the future of NIL at OU. One of the first things I thought of was like, man, I really wonder what guys like Kirby Smart have to say about this. Because I I think the world of Kirby, I think he's not only an elite recruiter, but like he was one of the first people to sit down after winning Georgia's national championship that first time he immediately sat down and started speaking to the changes that needed to be made in college football. And Mm -hmm. right. Whether folks want to admit it or not, he's earned that pedestal that he is now on. And I think his perspective is incredibly value. And I'm with you, man. It's, it's a great pick because I'm very curious to see what he thinks about where we're headed as the sec kind of takes over as one of truly the dominant forces Mm -hmm. in this board and all that comes with it. All right. So for me, my last pick, we're doing three, and then I think we'll maybe do some quick honorable mentions. Sure. The same reason that you brought up Josh Heupel, but kind of also some different ones, right, is is Jeff Levy and him taking yes. over With as you. the head coach at Mississippi State. Look, this was, this was something that we reported on very much in depth, not only at Sooners Illustrated, but Gene's page, which, which is our Mississippi State site. And, Josh, honestly, like, I think the the degree in which Oklahoma fans view Heupel and Levy as coordinators is obviously a little bit different. But we, we also do know some of the discourse that 
has been centered around Jeff Levy, especially towards the mm -hmm. back end of his tenure as a coordinator. However, why I bring him up, I personally feel as though sometimes Jeff Levy doesn't get all of the flowers that he may deserve because he stepped into his alumni base, right? His alma mater. Big shoes. Took yeah. over as a coordinator after one of the greatest offensive minds in football was was there and, and calling the plays. He not only stepped into kind of an empty cupboard at the time where he tried to keep Caleb Williams. We knew that wasn't going to happen. He had to face an overturned roster. He swung Dylan Gabriel in the last second when he was supposed to be in class at UCLA. <laughs> he gets Oklahoma a quarterback they really needed. He also had them in the mix for some other big names at quarterback, which I'll get into. Helped get Jackson Arnold, helped get some of these other guys. He, he, he was huge. And then, I mean, he was the guy calling plays that upset win over Texas in that final drive, right? And so, All right. Why I also want to bring him up, Josh, is what I think is very interesting. Jeff Levy, in one way or another, has been in a lot of different situations, but him now being a first year head coach. I've now seen, I don't know if you've seen this, I've seen some folks pick Mississippi State, if not second to last. Like some folks yeah. have him last in the For the bottom. Yeah. And I don't think Jeff Levy took that job thinking that Mississippi State was potentially going to be the last team selected in the SEC on some boards. Now, whether or not we wanted to debate that's true, that's a whole other conversation. But I think I'm really interested to see how he's feeling, how he compares being a head coach at a place like Mississippi State to being, quote, unquote, the head coach of the offense when he was at Oklahoma and everything he had to do to right that ship and how it maybe translates from an experience perspective over to, to, to Mississippi State. But then, like, you know, he's doing a really good job. Mississippi State has one of my favorites as a quarterback prospect in Camario Taylor committed. Mm -hmm. They have been in the thick of it for five-star Caleb Cunningham. I mean, Jeff's doing a lot of interesting stuff there at Mississippi State and just gauging where he's at. I I'm very excited to see how he's feeling at SEC Media Days. Completely agree. Um, you know, Jeff was um, a bit of a polarizing figure in, in Norman for a couple of years for whatever reason. Um, right. I mean, we talked on the show. I mean, it, during the season, you know, there were some times – <laughs> that, you know, there were some questionable decisions made by him offensively. You can't argue with the reality that he did help keep things afloat. You know, when Lincoln leaves, he steps in and helps them continue to add big-time quarterbacks. He's the reason Jackson Arnold is here now and, and all these things. And so, you know, there was a lot of questions at the end of the year if what was going to happen, if there would be any changes or anything to, to alter the offense. And he's going to a head coaching job in the SEC. And so it's – that's going to be very interesting to hear him talk about his time at OU and what made this job in Starkville the right one to jump to and and all that. That's going to be very, very interesting. He's got Blake Shape in there running the show now, too, who's another guy who we're obviously uh, very familiar with um, from his time at Baylor. So that, that's a great one. Let's see here. I'll go – there's a, I'll go with kind of a combination of, of a lot of our picks, kind of an amalgamation of all of them in a way um, with Shane Beamer um, because Shane mm. Beamer obviously – who was a former OU coach, like Heifel, like Levy. Um, but also, I'm curious, because he would know, right? I mean, he was at Oklahoma for a long time. He hasn't been to Oklahoma in the Brent Venables era. He was at mm -hmm. Oklahoma for a long time. He's been in the SEC now for a while with the Game Cox. He would know as well, really, as anyone, just as far as the direction Oklahoma's moving in as far as getting into the SEC and where they're ready and where they're not and all that. Again, he hasn't been here in the last couple of years, so. But still, you know, you know, he's keeping up from afar. He's always had great things to say about the program. It was a very good terms deal. It still is. OU fans are still very fond of Shane Beamer. He speaks highly of OU whenever he has opportunity. And so that'll be fun to get to hear from him. He was always a, a favorite of ours in the media. Um, the chance we got to talk to him because he's just a great, great guy, great talker. And that'll be fun to get to hear from him and catch up with him a little bit. It's also obviously a, a big year for him. You know, South Carolina's had some great highs under him. You know, think of a couple of years ago, they beat Tennessee and, and uh, Clemson back to back. But then last year, they kind of took a step backwards with Spencer Rattler. So, you know, looking forward to seeing and hearing from him a little bit and, and seeing if he dives into any of the OU aspect. I'm sure it'll come up. It'll come up with a lot of these coaches. But just for him, having been at OU, he'll have that kind of unique perspective uh, on all of this. So he's certainly up there for me as far as intrigue uh, to hear what he has to say uh, next week. You know, 
this is the time of year for me where you're, you're coming out of commit season and we're getting ready to start what I call convention season. So you've got mm-hmm. media days and I'm going to like the personnel symposium uh, at the start of August where a bunch of off field college staffers get together and I'm going to go to that as well. But one thing I go to every summer, Josh, is what's called coaching school. It's a Texas high school coaching convention in San Antonio. And why that's important to bring up is they invite college coaches from across the country to come and speak and meet with Texas high school coaches. And Shane Beamer was one of the lecturers at THSCA coaching school last Mm -hmm. year. And one of the first things that he said, Josh, during his lecture was he talked about how when he was at Oklahoma, how much he learned about recruiting and how he learned at OU how important it is to build relationships in the South Central region, namely states like Oklahoma and Texas. And he talked about some stories that he had being a coach at OU and recruiting for a brand name like Oklahoma in the state of Texas, which is now going to only increase in terms of being a recruiting hotbed for the Southeastern Conference. And he talked about how he took those lessons in recruiting at Oklahoma and now applies them at South Carolina. He always talks about OU when he can. And I think that's a great pick by you as well, because he will have some, some positive things to say about Oklahoma, even if maybe like an Eli Drinkwitz has something negative. So uh, <laughs> I will rattle off a quick couple of honorable mentions. Yeah. Any honorable mentions, anything we missed. All right. Number one for me is Steve Sarkeesian, either a getting asked about horns down or yeah, B, Texas. Yeah getting snappy with somebody who asks a bad question because I I personally, I love Sark. I, I have dealt with Sark on or off the field from a recruiting perspective, and I, I really do like him as a head coach. But one thing that I love, and I was talking about this on the radio earlier today in, in Austin, Steve Sarkeesian, while he will be very open and honest sometimes, and he, he's not always worried about giving the, the shrouded answer, He will give you some very insightful comments. Steve Sarkeesian will also let you know in one way or another whether or not you ask him a stupid question. And whether it's Mm -hmm. someone asking about horns down or is Texas back or the Red River rivalry compared to like the Iron Bowl. Someone's going to ask Steve Sarkeesian a question and he's either going to give a great response or he's not going to do what Brent would do. And he's going to be like, "Why? what are you doing? So I, I'm in, I'm curious to see what, what Steve Sarkeesian sure. says or does in SEC media days. And again, that comes from a place of respect. I, I really value his opinion, and I appreciate his honesty when some people need it. If you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm curious. With Sark, thing I'm, you know, with Sark, just real quick, he, you know, I, yeah. I felt like you know a few years ago, his first Big Twelve media days, he didn't seem especially comfortable to me, and that came that progressed, you know, year by year, as you'd expect. I'm curious how where he's at with this, this whole new landscape of SEC media days and all that. I'm kind of with you there and just, you know, it's a big year for Texas, obviously. And so it'll it'll be interesting to hear from him for sure. Yeah, I just I go back to like a favorite appearance of mine from him recently was when he hopped on with Josh Pate and talked about some of the changing landscape in college yeah. football. And he had the sound bite where he was like, I had folks coming up to me being like, props to Arch Manning for sticking it out another year. And Sark was like, he's a sophomore. He's going into year <laughs> two. And so Sark, Sark yeah. is very honest. And I, Somebody I will ask really about Arch. Yeah. Arch and I think in a way, like Oklahoma and Texas are coming into this transition together. And Brent and Sark are very complimentary, in my opinion. And so mm-hmm. his honesty, for good or bad, is going to be much needed in the SEC Media Day setting. Then the last honorable mention that I have, Josh, is I, I'm really looking forward to talking to Jackson Dart. Because he is yeah. obviously the he's the quarterback of an Ole Miss football team. I, I've said this, and, and we'll I'm sure get into this more. I think the Ole Miss Oklahoma game is the most overlooked game on that schedule. I, I Ole Miss what they did in the transfer portal. They have a really good roster. They're going to bring Oklahoma to the Grove, and Lane Kiffin's going to have a whole bunch to say that week. So you know that atmosphere could be electric and. Ole Miss is the top 17 in the country last time I checked. I mean, they're, they're, they're highly thought of. But I bring up Jackson Dart specifically because I've heard not only is he a really good interview, he's got some good stuff to say, but people forget Oklahoma went after him in the transfer portal. OU 
had him on a visit and they wanted him to come to Norman and potentially be the quarterback of the future. But now not only is he going to play a program that was once recruiting him in the portal and he chose Ole Miss over, he's not only going to bring OU to Ole Miss and play them in a highly ranked matchup. He's also got the primary recruiter who is trying to bring him to OU mm. now as the head coach of his primary rival in Mississippi State. Sure enough. Right? Like yeah. Jeff, he's going to have to square off against Jeff Levy, who was trying to get him to Oklahoma once upon a time. So I don't know, man. Jackson Dart, it, I, mean, I think the world of him as a player, and I've heard he's awesome to deal with. And I just feel like kind of going back down memory lane with him and getting his thoughts on both Oklahoma and then Jeff Levy at, at Mississippi State is, is going to be really cool to try and gauge at least during media days. Yeah, that was a very fun like week or two when it was like maybe they're going to get Jackson Dart and Dylan Gabriel and it was like how's that going to work how's that going to shake out um right and that working out for both parties obviously yeah a couple other honorable mentions real quick um I mean Kalen DeBoer is interesting obviously Alabama comes to Norman mm-hmm. this year Kalen DeBoer I mean before you know I don't know the early to middle part of last season I'm not sure if I could have told you what Kalen DeBoer looked or sounded like I mean he was out there watching it's not a program that Oklahoma deals with very often all of a sudden, it became clear, like, okay, this is a guy we need to pay attention to, watching and getting a natural title game. And now he's Nick Saban's successor, which is what a crazy run that is for him. So interesting to see here from him and, and if that Oklahoma game comes up at all, because that's just a heavyweight. I mean, Alabama coming to Norman is yeah. just so cool uh, for just a – if you're just a fan of college football, that's just awesome. So hear from him will be will be pretty cool. Then just kind of a wrap-up of some of these other guys. I mean, Brian Kelly – uh, certainly Lane Kiffin's always outspoken, no telling what he'll say about Oklahoma or Texas. If it comes up, I'm sure it will. Um, certainly Mark Stoops, always fun to hear from a Stoops. Um, they, OU doesn't play Kentucky, unfortunately, these first couple of years. But at some point, they will. You assume he'll probably still be there because he's Mark Stoops, who is one of the most underrated coaches in the country on a year-in, year-out basis. And so there's a number of guys. The SEC is loaded with personalities, loaded with big-time players. That's why it's the best league in America. And it's going to be really fun to be there next week. I'm really looking forward to it. The whole new world for us. Big Swim Media Days was this last week in Vegas, and it felt weird not being there. Yeah. It felt strange. Now, if it was at at and it would have felt even more weird, but it was in Vegas, which is a, quite the move. Um, but it was. It felt strange not being there. It did. Um, but I really look forward to next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're all going to be there, like I said. Expect a lot of coverage from all of us, especially on Tuesday. Obviously, that's when OU goes. Be sure to keep up with the YouTube channel to look for Brent Venable's press conference along with the breakout sessions with the players. We're going to get all that up on the YouTube channel so you can watch all that, everything they have to say. And uh, we'll probably have recap videos and stuff like that. A lot going to be coming out of Dallas uh, next week. But look forward to it, man. It's going to be fun. SEC Media Days. And it's always, you know, the Media Days week is always kind of that moment where you really feel like we're, we're getting somewhere. Like football is – is around the corner and uh so i'm looking forward to it it's a good kind of unofficial kind of kickoff in some ways of like the season in in some capacity fall camp is coming up just a couple weeks after so it's gonna be fun looking forward to it next week hopefully everybody joins along for all the coverage and, and along for the ride it's gonna be fun the pinnacle of talking season leads to the it beginning is. of football season and yes. at a time where not only is oklahoma moving into a new conference but i mean this conference is loaded with not just storylines, but quality football and talent and coaching. I I can't wait to get out there. And yes, it it is very weird that we weren't at Big 12 Media Days. And honestly, I'm a little bit upset that the parking fees at SEC Media Days are so high. But (laughs) yes, I guess it just means more. And I I think it's going to be really cool, some of the stuff that we get out of SEC Media Days as Oklahoma prepares to be a new member of this conference. Can anybody draw a headline like Mike Gundy did last week? That is my challenge to uh, these SEC coaches. Can anybody make national airwaves the way that our, our, old, our old buddy Gundy did uh, last week in Vegas with some of the stuff he had to say? Uh, our buddy McLean over at uh, Go Pokes, he had his hands full uh, last week. But uh, we'll see. Yeah. If hopefully nobody, nobody on the OU side does anything quite like that uh, next week in Dallas. That's it for us. Loaded show, had a lot to ground to cover. First show in a couple of weeks. We'll get back on a more normal track 
like I said, I don't think we'll have a show early part of next week. There will be a lot of videos and recaps and stuff. I assume probably Thursday or Friday will be our next formal show. We may have the full boat for it, maybe all four of us. I don't know. We'll have to kind of – we'll figure it out. We have some some time to plan it out. But look for that next week. And then after that, we'll get back on a more normal two-show-a-week schedule going into fall camp, which is coming up uh, really, really soon. And the start of the season will be here before you know it as well, seven weeks from today. So that's it for now. Be sure to subscribe to Sooners Illustrated. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, obviously, as well as the podcast feed, wherever you like to take it in. For Colin Kennedy, I'm Josh Cowell. We'll see you guys next week from Dallas in SEC Media Days. We'll see you next time here on the Sooners Illustrated Podcast.